These segments are about the moments following the flood or the first little tower, the first little pyramid with the eye in the center, the birth of all the cult, and also the birth of Israel. The entire Bible is a tale of two cities. Also, a version of the story of Nimrod and Abraham that I'm fairly certain you haven't heard before. And Nimrod, he's, he's nicknamed, so when you hear, and you've got a variety of titles of the Antichrist. So Nimrod is actually a foreshadowing of your, of your last guy. He's a real guy. That's a real artifact of that real guy. When you see Santa Claus depictions, you're actually looking at depictions of, of Nimrod. He would be holding the sacred goat that's become the reindeer. He's, you know, he's got the little pagan tree because all, you know, pagan worship goes with the, goes with the trees and the decoration of the of the trees. In fact, the bulbs on the trees represent fertility or little nipples that are hanging down. This is Nimrod. He was married to some Ramses or Semiramis. Okay, and she, according to legend, worked at, uh, she actually worked the local tavern. She was the head waitress there. Whatever, they, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's according to legend. She became the goddess. All right, so you've got Nimrod and Semiramis. Now, it's my belief that Gilgamesh was uh, following the union of these two, that's debatable. So it's you know, looking at this ancient history, it's you got to pick through little details. Anyhow, that's just my speculation and my belief, and I, I could give you strong cause, but that's not the time for it. Nimrod is your first little king and first little tower builder. Now, I'm going to uh, explain to you the story behind Nimrod as according to the text of the book of Yasha or the book of the upright. This is a, this is a Hebrew text. It's like a documentary style version of exactly what you're reading in Genesis. I would never hold it to biblical canon, but I do believe that the text is, is accurate. Abram, whose name would become Abraham. This was Terah's son. Terah would be the head idol maker. He's the head, and this is in either Genesis or the book of Yasher. Just getting an expanded version. Terah was the head idol maker for Nimrod. And Nimrod's uh, witch doctors, the priests, his demon summonsers, and that's even what they're called. Okay, everybody. These people understood by the stars that a special child was going to be born, and from that child uh, would conquer the uh, basically the empires of, uh, of darkness, or the bloodline of that child. So they went to go pay tribute the priests and the demon worshippers and all of these these guys, the Nimrod. They went to go pay homage because everybody understood the stars and what they meant. The zodiac above tells the biblical story. Some of these, these little demon worshiper guys, little, little, little pagan priests, they went to Nimrod and they said, wait, a child's been born in Terah's house. It's a very special child. But you need to kill this child, King, because if this child is allowed to live, he's going to overthrow your whole empire, your whole system. Nimrod took this to mean immediately. But this is what the signs, the signs where the signs coming from the goat were predicting so Nimrod goes into Terra and says Terra look let me let me pay you off with a bunch of gold and stuff to kill your kid it's what he did it's about as straightforward as it is Terra didn't want to kill his son and there's this complex set of issues long and short of it is he hid Abram and this is what ended up happening to Abram Abram was ultimately sent after a series of events he was sent to go live up in the mountains with Noah and Shem. He was learning from Noah and Shem. Okay, so this bloodline that would lead to the elect, right? Coming through Enoch, right? Coming ultimately through Adam, who was a son of God. Okay, now, and also in the text, when you're reading Beneha Elohim, which means son of God, okay? That's how we translate it. When you're looking in the Greek, and okay, when, when God says to which of the angels did I call my son okay, 
this word Beneha Elohim. You could apply the same word in truth. You could also apply it to Adam because it's more like an attribute. Now it does not mean, I'm not meaning to state that these two things mean the same thing. They do not. But the word Beneha Elohim most directly means a direct creation of God. That's what the angels are and that's what Adam was. Now Adam is something different than those angels. He is this was just like Jesus is a son of God. Okay? So when God says to which of the angels that I call my son, there's something intrinsically special about mankind that is different than those angels. Abram goes to live. Abram goes to live with Noah and Shem. And so also after Abram, but also Isaac until Noah died, and then it would just be Shem. And then Shem would ultimately die. But Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Or Jacob, of course, his name was changed to Israel. Because he's the father of the 12 sons, which would become the 12 tribes of Israel, which ultimately would lead through the line of the tribe of Judah, which would lead directly through to Jesus Christ. And the, the artifacts for all of this, the artifacts for all of the cities, the sites, and everything that are listed in that Bible, as well as that book of Jasher, are all, are all there. There's almost nothing that has not been found. So Abram. Abram lives with, with Noah and Shem, and he learns from them. And then he comes back later. Nimrod doesn't know who he is. He thinks that kid that he paid for it to be killed, he paid Terah to kill this kid. He thought that kid was dead because that's what Terah told him. So when Abram comes back, nobody knows who he is. Well, Nimrod, the most important guy, doesn't know who he is. Well, Abram's father is the head idol maker for the king who's making the tower. So Abram decides to test his father's theory because his father has all of the idols of the gods around. So Abram comes in and he brings a sacrifice for the gods and lays it out amongst the idols. And he's sitting there and he's waiting and nothing happens. So then he decides to destroy all of the idols with an axe, except for one, the largest of the idols. And he leaves that idol, he leaves that idol there and he puts the axe that he used to cut the other ones up in its hand. And he goes off and Terah comes in and then the other, the other guys that own these idols as well, all little demon worshippers and summonsers and all this, they come in and they see that their idols are destroyed and they're mad, they're tearing their clothes. They go to Nimrod. Nimrod brings Abram in and he says, what have, what have you done? What have, you've destroyed the idols. You've destroyed the gods. And Abram says, no, my king, I, 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 what, uh, what are you saying? Nimrod said, are you, are you saying that you didn't do this? You didn't destroy these idols? And Abram, Abram says, no, of course not. I brought an offering, but I only had enough for one. I set it down in the middle of them. The little ones all jumped for it. And the large one took its axe and it hacked them all up. And now what you see is where it stands. And the king says to him, says, do you think I'm stupid? Enough to believe that, what you're telling me? And Abram responds to the king, King Nimrod, king of all earth, and says, my king, you say that what I've told you is foolish, but yet you tell the men of all earth that these idols made of wood and stone that these idols are the gods that created the heavens and the earth. How foolish are you, my king? And yet you don't believe what little I just told you? But yet you say this? And this perplexed Nimrod that he would say such a thing. But his enchanters, his little witchy people came in. They say, you've got to kill him because he's insulted all of us. You have to kill him. So Nimrod decides, and what the way they did things back then, and notice this is following the flood. This is the way that, that it occurs, following the flood. This would also happen to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
Nimrod is going to have him thrown into the fire, the fiery furnace. And also Haran, the brother of Abraham, is going to be thrown into that fire too. They're going to be thrown in together. And this is why ultimately Abram would feel a, uh, a burden to take care of Haran's son Lot, uh, which would have its own set of troubles later. But this, they were both thrown into the fire together because Nimrod discovered you have to read the text to get the bottom of this, but he, he discovers in the process of having Abram in custody that, uh, that he is in fact the child that should have been killed a long time ago that he already paid Terah for. And Terah even is wimpy about it. And he, he, these people are all wimps. Abram gets thrown into the fire. Now, Haran, his brother, burns up like that. Abram does not. Abram does not. Now, prior to this, one of the other things that Abram told King Nimrod is he said, you're doing the same things that the people did before the flood, which made God destroy the world. Dear, how foolish are you, my king? This is what was perplexing Nimrod's mind because he knew and you got texts out there in Samaria where he had high respect for Lord Arata those living up in the mountains because Nimrod knew he wasn't stupid he knew he threw Abram into that fire and Abram was not burning he says in the text that he didn't burn and he was in there for three days but Jesus was in the tomb for three days according to and Nimrod keeps coming back and forth for these three days and yelling in there are you still alive and Abram, Abram keeps yelling back yes I'm still alive in here why haven't you burned up? And finally Abram answers him and says, I don't rightly know. But it must be because of the God of our fathers that preserves me in this flame. Now, first judgment was with water. But you will be passed through the fire. Abram comes out and for a while he's and Nimrod is he's respected but the, the witchy people come in and mess with him again Abram is living with his father Terah and this is where God is going to call him out into the land that would ultimately be Israel and Abram Abraham his name was changed to Abraham he did a lot of he did a lot of stupid things but he loved and trusted God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Those particular clips come out of the Enoch documentary and commentary. They go over Melchizedek, this unusual character named Melchizedek, and who exactly that is. This is the most in, as well as Enoch's calendar. I packed, injected some quite a bit on the calendar into this particular document. In my view, this is probably the best crash course, easy breakdown of the book of Enoch that you're going to find in the entire world. Also, is part of the God in a Nutshell unveiling set, which includes entities the beginning and entities the unveiling. Seen right here in my hand. And this disc, this is no joke. I wanted there to be a set of this where the paranormal, the supernatural, there's so much of that that it almost becomes a backdrop to what what is the purpose of the demonic the supernatural the right here you see on the screen guy fading out in a battery of time-lapse imagery seen right here. and this these shots here in the time-lapse frames we get the guy slowly appearing and walking around sort of translucent on the beach and then slowly fades out in, in this particular set of clips I actually knew the camera guy that took the images that are within entities and it's loaded with that stuff but more than that the supernatural is like a backdrop 
to a bigger picture and that's why it took two full documentaries to truly cover that from beginning to end sprinkled all along the way jam-packed with stuff like this going on from start to finish we also of course i think can get to the bottom of what happened at roswell and more than that i think we can do it in under 15 minutes while you're watching this particular video the unveiling set is at least at this moment is on sale over at godinanutshell.com and it's free shipping at least right now where you're watching this no matter where you are on the planet don't worry where you are that's our problem the shipping is free at least at this moment it's our problem how to get it to your doorstep the pages of enoch which i'm going to take you through it's not just just artifacts that we had today like the one sitting on my desk but i take you through in that documentary the reasons why i believe and compelling read i think you're going to leave that documentary believing strongly that there's strong cause to believe that those pages are exactly what they claim to be but more than that Enoch begins his book by stating these are the words of the blessing of Enoch blessed be the elect and righteous those are two different groups who will be living in the day of trouble the day of tribulation when the wicked and the godless are to be removed he goes on to say these words are not for my generation but for a remote one which is for to come the last generation that being stated it was pretty important at least to me to figure out exactly what he said I've spent the last several years on that book and again from my view it's the best breakdown of the Book of Enoch that you're going to find anywhere. I'm Trey Smith. God bless every last one of you on the other side of this screen.